How's the job market in your industry right now? You started out with some of the lowest unemployment numbers in decades, and there seems to be no end in sight to the great resignation of 2022 this year. But there's still a lot of issues dealing with the workspace these days. On today's Ask the Expert, we're joined by Shannon McCain. She's a workplace expert as well as motivational speaker, and she is in the KRLD Zoom room. Shannon, thank you so much for the time. David, thank you so much for having me on again. When you're giving out your talks, you talk about something called the great divide at the workplace. What is that? Yeah, well, so just a little bit of background about myself. I'm so passionate about people having professional lives and personal lives that they absolutely love. And frankly, for most of us, we have to spend a fair amount of our time in the workplace. But the unfortunate thing is that for the last decade or so, we have been so divided in so many key areas. And I feel strongly that we are focusing really too much on those divides and not enough on what actually brings us together. And the whole thing is this divide that you speak of, it's not just in the workplace. It's literally the entire nation is divided in some fashion. What is it about people that makes us so divisive? Well, golly, that could be a whole segment in and of itself. But I think particularly today, we are just so riled up because we have so much information at our fingertips. And people are more empowered now more than ever to be able to assert their opinions or their feelings or their emotions about something. And that's valid. People should be able to have that opportunity. However, we're not doing it in constructive ways to where we can still continue to be pulled together on those issues. What do you see are the biggest workplace trends into 2023 as we are really just into the birth of this new year? Yeah, so we've we've been through so much in the last three years. And so I think today we're seeing more burnout, more fatigue, more confusion, more anxiety and more mental health issues than we've ever seen before. And so I think when you talk about the last three years that we've all experienced, essentially, we disrupted the apple cart in every particular sense. And human beings need stability. We need control. We really do need parameters to make us feel and do our best work in life. And so when all of that got disrupted these last three years, it's really leaving us with an open-endedness of this confusion coming out of it. One thing we had seen for the last couple of years has been given the nickname, the great resignation, where people found other jobs in other places. But that's also getting followed by what they're calling the great regret, where they look back and say, it's not so great on the other side. Yeah, the grass isn't necessarily greener, right? Oh my goodness. I mean, the workplace issues that we're seeing today has really truly become a PhD level like of how do we solve this equation or this problem? And so, yeah, I think employees are definitely saying, you know, man, like we were able to shift in this direction or this direction and we thought that we would find some kind of solace or greater meaning, but really it's not the case. It really isn't. And, and they didn't know what to expect when they went into the great unknown of the new company. And what they did end up losing was any seniority they had at their old place. And they might be finding this company that I just joined, I might be making a little more money, but is that extra money worth it? Yeah, absolutely. And in the 20 plus years that I've been really analyzing and educating on workplace culture and issues, you know, people think that they are motivated by money, but really at the end of the day, we are not. Um, we are motivated by so many other facets. And for example, right now, we are seeing younger millennials and particularly Gen Z not being motivated in the traditional senses whatsoever. Whereas, you know, career trajectory and hierarchy and getting promotions or the fear of even being laid off, those aren't even anything on Gen Z's radar right now. They are motivated in completely different ways. But they haven't seen what it's like on the other side, when unemployment numbers up, upwards of, you know, 12, 13, even upwards of 20 percent in, in previous decades. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this next year we are still looking at a lot of uncertainty, especially with a pending recession, especially with all the layoffs that we are currently seeing and will potentially see here within the next few months. 
And a lot of people had, you talk about layoffs, a lot of people had interest in getting into the tech sector because it seemed like it's a lot of fun and all the perks that Google and Facebook were providing. And the layoffs are really hitting the tech sector very hard at this point. Yeah. I mean, if you jump on LinkedIn on any given day, it's like you almost see another announcement, another announcement, another announcement. And, you know, frankly, I don't think that that's doing anything for our mental health either. Yeah. Let's talk about LinkedIn for just a second. You brought it up. That gives younger employees a chance to find new work, something that older employees really never had before. They in, in the old days, they had to stick and, and look through the want ads and, on, and through networking and everything else. How big of a sea change has LinkedIn been? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I've I've watched LinkedIn from its inception. I mean, it was kind of born, golly, back in even the early 2000s. And uh, the way that it's been able to allow us another tool to really try to leverage not only our networks, but also communication professionally has just been an incredible uh piece for us. And so I wish that younger generations would understand that and really leverage it to its full potential. Um, You know, the way that we communicate, the way that we write, the way that we put our information out there is being utilized in really great ways on LinkedIn right now. What are people missing out in, in not using LinkedIn? constantly reevaluating our profiles, constantly updating them, constantly thinking about like, how can we uh, promote ourselves? Um, The idea of a personal brand and self-promotion is a very real thing. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk talks a lot about like day trading our time. You know, we're not, that's our currency right now. Like everybody's just constantly trying to stay relevant and stay in front of other people. And so LinkedIn is no different and your personal brand. And so you have to continually think about what do I need to add to my brand? What do I need to communicate and put out there professionally? And then also, you know, being able to uh, communicate with others and really have a discussion or a dialogue. So contributing to different conversations across the platform or following different hashtags, or again, just keeping people up to date with what you're doing. That's got to be tougher for older workers that don't necessarily know how to use LinkedIn properly. What steps would you tell someone that is an older person that hasn't necessarily used it? Sure, absolutely. So I think the first thing that you can do is Google is your best friend, right? I mean, you can Google and research anything. So if you have a very minute question of, you know, how do I get started on LinkedIn? I'm sure that there's, you know, 25 different videos on YouTube or on Google to teach you how to do that. Um, But from a fundamental standpoint, you know, just in terms of thinking about it as, you know, you have your uh, physical real estate, you know, say your home, your apartment, your town home, wherever it is that you live, but think about your digital real estate and being able to put all of your information professionally in one place that everyone can find it. So recruiters can search for you so that you're using the right keywords and metrics to be able to say, okay, here's who are the, who I want to connect with professionally. And then also just being able to create status updates um, and just saying, Hey, like, here's what's going on with me week to week or day to day. I guess it's, it's basically turning yourself, as you said, into your own brand that has to get the message out there about what it is you are and what it is you do. And how do you get that message out to followers? And how do you find those followers? Yeah, absolutely. There's a fellow by the name of Richard Bliss that he is really doing a lot of education right now around the proper ways to use LinkedIn to where you can really optimize how you're getting your information out there and what your reach is. And so just like with anything else online right now, you know, we're really subjected to the algorithms that these parent companies want us to follow and adhere to. And so it can be very cumbersome. (laughs) So for listeners that are listening in right now, I don't want you to get too into the weeds on that particularly, but just thinking about professionally, like how do you just write and articulate, you know, a couple of important sentences about what's going on with you and where you're at in your career. And then of course, engaging and finding the people that you know and connecting with them, it will just continue to build a bigger reach. We were talking earlier about Gen Z and younger millennials. They don't seem to have the same 
attitudes towards a workplace as older women no, might. No, absolutely not. And, you know, you know me, David, as a keynote speaker, and I talk about all areas of workplace culture and workplace issues. And one of the key areas is different generations and how they are motivated, how they communicate and what they value. And particularly with Gen Z right now, we're not seeing them motivated in the traditional ways whatsoever. So historically, you know, generations were very motivated by terms of seniority and hierarchy and working their way up the corporate ladder. But right now, Gen Z is just simply not wanting to do that. They see that as a very stressful move and they're willing to forego the extra income or the additional perks of getting into middle management or, you know, climbing the ladder for what they perceive to be a better work-life balance maybe perhaps being able to have more flexibility and just kind of stay in where they're at. And they're also not motivated at all by the fear of being terminated. And so when you look at the psychology of this generation, we have to tackle it in a completely different way than we have with any other generation. But how does that affect the companies themselves as they're looking to replace workers and and they're finding out that the workers that they're hiring don't care if they're there or not? So the biggest thing for management and employers to understand is to first and foremost, understand the psychology, and then they can be able to talk and tackle that particular psychology. So for example, right now, we're seeing that the number one motivating factor just kind of across the board in every area of employment is that employees just simply want to feel safe. They want to feel psychologically safe. They want to feel like that they can speak up or contribute without the fear of being reprimanded. And they want to understand that their employer trusts them, especially when we're still working in a hybrid environment. And we don't really want to work the traditional nine to five anymore. And so employees want their employers to be able to trust them that they're going to get the work done and they're being productive, even if it's not at the right place or the right time nine to five, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does make sense. And you talk about other issues because we've seen it in school districts. We've seen it in other offices. A lot of companies are looking to, to stand out among possible job applicants. And one of those involves something like a four day work week. Is that going to become more normal in the near future? So it's a very interesting climate that we're looking at right now. Now, the four-day work weeks that we're seeing, as you had mentioned, in education and also in corporate America, you know, that's kind of a two-part thing that we're seeing right now. One, in part because of labor shortages in education and schools across America, we're just simply not seeing teachers wanting to come to work and teach. And so that's been a really huge issue. So we're seeing that in terms of labor shortages, but then we're also seeing it in terms of the demand of the psychological needs and wants of workers today. What people don't remember or understand, or maybe have forgotten that the five-day workplace hasn't always been that way. In fact, the five-day, nine-to-five workplace didn't actually get implemented in corporate America until 1926, when Ford Motor Company actually adopted that particular work schedule. Prior to 1926, we were looking at labor as a very strenuous and hard types of careers and jobs, and that the expectation was that workers were working six to seven days a week, even 10, 12, 14 plus hours a day. There were no, like, uh, there was no standard or structure outside of that. Either you show up and you do it or you don't. And then in 1926, Ford Motor Company said, I don't think that this is, you know, where we, the future of work needs to go. And they implemented this five day work week, nine to five, and everybody gasped and said, oh my gosh, this is crazy. This isn't going to work, but it did. And then we did that for a century and now we're seeing the apple cart get turned upside down again. So I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens in these next couple of years with the four day work week. Do you see companies looking towards older workers to take on some of these jobs that the Gen Z and millennials might not, or are older workers kind of being left out in this great surge of hiring? Yeah, I think that older generations are certainly kind of at a crux right now and across in the road of trying to understand what their place is in navigating all of this. And so I think in general, employees are being asked to do 
all different kinds of things that are putting them outside of their comfort zones. And so I think, yeah, older generations need to ask themselves what they are willing to step up to the plate and do and or what they have to do in order to continue their career until they can successfully retire. One other phrase that came out, and this will probably be the, the, the last question we talk about, is the phrase that came out in the last year was the phrase quiet quitting, where people decided, I'm going to do my job to the best of my ability. I'm not taking on anything extra. Is that still the case? Are companies saying, okay, just do your job and, and we'll hang on to you? <laughs> well, I mean, we have all these like fancy terms that we're coming up with these days. And I think if you really look at the evolution of the workplace in general, I mean, you're always going to have those workers that are above average and want to just continue to push and push and push and do anything and everything to impress their managers. And then you're also going to have the workers that are going to say, no, like this is all that I can accomplish. This is what I was hired to do. And so then therefore I'm going to get that done and then move on and go you know, home and do what I need to do personally. And so um, from a quiet quitting standpoint, you know, I think just in general, companies are just trying to do whatever they can right now to make things work and be successful. And so, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, I think we all need to ask ourselves, what are we doing to at least meet in the middle to be able to make our workplaces productive and successful? Shannon McCain is a workplace expert, motivational speaker. You can find her at shannonmccain.com on today's Ask the Expert. Shannon, thank you. Thank you so much, David. I hope this helps your listeners today.